How's it going, guys? Joxa here with another video. Thank you so much for joining me with part three of this series where I talk about how to get your first software engineering job in 2021. In this video, I want to talk about the challenge, which is basically going through the interview process, code tests, whiteboarding, post interview behaviors, and things of that nature. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, with the typical interview process, it all starts after you first apply. So I imagine at this point, you've already started applying to jobs or you started looking at jobs relevant to the field that you kind of want to go into, whether that be front end, back end, or full stack. Um, and you start with the application. So the application process kind of starts with a couple of things. So for one, you obviously have your resume, which you want to cater to the company that you're specifically applying to. Unfortunately, that does require a little bit of extra effort on your part because you have to reformat your essay every time you apply to somebody that looks for a specific technology. So for example, if you're applying to a React job, you want to make sure you have a lot of experience or projects related to the React position. I'm um, talking about React hooks or other, you know, React based uh, keywords or common talking points in your resume to make you stand out that much more as an applicant. Now, this isn't always the case, especially when you're first starting out, especially also if you're applying to a lot of the jobs with similar titles, but it definitely helps if you put in that little bit of extra effort to kind of tweak your resume to fit what the application is looking for that much more. Um, the second big piece of this is a cover letter. Now, there's a lot of mixed information out there about whether or not a cover letter is necessary. Most of the information that I reviewed have always recommended rewriting a cover letter, but I have spoken to some people who say that they never have done it. Uh, my recommendation is that you definitely write a cover letter and much like the resume, uh, or even more so, you should cater your cover letter specifically to the company that you're applying to. Now, this requires a little bit of research on your part to make sure you're doing your job of, you know, looking at the company you're applying to, figuring out a little bit about them and like what the, what, how your role may relate to what they're looking to accomplish um, and in trying to include that or to speak relative to that in your cover letter and basically emphasize how you could help that company approach or achieve that objective. So for example, if you're applying to a front end React developer position, and one of the things that they're looking at doing that's specific in the in the job application is they talk about joining a team that is, you know, transitioning from one tech stack to another one that includes React. You can talk about your React experience and some of the relative projects you may have worked on to show that you're relevant to their objectives while providing some examples of what makes you a good fit as an applicant. So little things like that, catering your resume and more importantly, catering your cover letter will help you kind of have a little bit more of a leg up when you're applying, especially if you have a lot of different applicants applying to the same job. This typically happens with like larger companies or more popular companies. So I definitely recommend you bear that in mind. Now, the second phase of this process is the company or the recruiter or the hiring manager will reach out to you and invite you to interview. Now, in my experience, normal interview processes start with a behavioral or kind of an introductory interview. Um, if you're going through a recruiter, sometimes the recruiter will call you beforehand and kind of vet you or ask you some questions about your experience before they pass you on to their client. If you're dealing with the company directly or a hiring manager, sometimes they'll just go ahead and invite you to a behavioral interview. Now, the behavioral interview is usually pretty simple. It just asks you some common questions about like, you know, who you are, learning about you, uh, what your experience is and um, whether or not you have, you're able to, to judge whether or not you're able to kind of talk about your experience and have some of those social skills that are kind of required when dealing with any job. Usually the behavioral interview isn't that difficult. Um, sometimes they may ask you some specific culture fit questions, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. As long as you're honest, you're true to yourself, and you're able to kind of conduct and speak about yourself in a productive and easy um, to understand manner, you usually will have no issues uh, passing the behavioral interview. Now, after the introductory or the behavioral interview, they'll sometimes go ahead and invite you to a technical interview. So the behavioral interview is usually uh, either a single step or a multi-step process. In my experience, my behavioral interview consisted of a technical discussion. So what I mean by that is usually I would end up interviewing with either the tech lead, the se one of the senior devs, or sometimes the entire dev team at once, in which they'll kind of, you know, ask me some questions relevant to my experience and how it relates to, you know, the job application itself, you know, what the technologies they're looking for you to you to have experience in, um, or how your previous experience might relate to what they're looking to accomplish going forward. So it really helps to be able to fully understand the technologies that you're applying to. So for example, if you're applying to a React or an Angular position, you wanna make sure you're able to answer some of the most common interview questions related to that. 
If you don't know if you can answer those, I highly recommend just researching some basic React interview questions or Angular interview questions, um, C Sharp interview questions, just to kind of get an idea of like what you might be asked and how you can start preparing to uh, answer those questions to the best of your ability. So usually technical discussions are just really straightforward. You know, they may look at your projects and your GitHub or they may uh, pull up a project that they're currently working on and ask you to talk about it. Um, sometimes they'll ask you like architectural questions. It just kind of depends on the company and what the actual requirements of the application you're filling out is. Um, so like I said, it really helps to do some preliminary research on what they're expecting you to know and make sure you are able to have some level of a uh, you know, conversation, a technical conversation about it. For example, you know, if I apply to a React position, I, would, I want to make sure I'm able to talk about, you know, some of the latest things regarding React, like functional components or React hooks um, or things of that nature. Same thing with Angular or any other language. You want to make sure you're pretty caught up on some of the latest news. Make sure you're able to talk about, you know, the basics of using that language um, and being able to implement that in a project. One thing that also really helps is to make sure you're very well versed in the projects you have on your GitHub. If you are interviewing with a, uh, a tech lead or a dev, be it a senior, mid, or somebody else on your team, um, I have often seen that they'll look at your projects and question you about it. So make sure you're just kind of caught up to date with you know the work that you've done. If you haven't made any improvements recently, skim back through it so that way you have some type of talking point since you don't have any relative experience being that this is your first dev job. Same goes for if you have any internships under your belt or some freelance work in the past. Just again, make sure you're able to talk about it and, and carry on a conversation. Now, sometimes these technical interviews may require you to have a code test or some type of code assessment. Um, I've seen it to, uh, where the code test is preliminary, meaning you do it before your interview, either the day or two before. And I've seen some that are, you know, during the interview. And I've seen some that are both, that are that have a preliminary test and an in-person test. The best way that you can prepare for these things, really it just comes down to the company. What I've noticed is the company size and the, the, the best way that you can kind of prepare for these things are twofold. For one, you can do your typical hacker rank, leak code questions, you know, some of the common, you know, coding to assessment questions. Another way is just constantly using these languages just in your own projects or following tutorials, that's why, that way you can build up your general experience regarding them. Because every company that I've seen has a different way of handling code tests. I mean, some don't even have a code test, some have a very simple code test, and some go you know all out with lead quote questions and hacker rank questions, data structures and algorithms. It all just kind of depends on the, the size of the company that I've seen and what it is that you're actually working with. So with all that in mind, try to figure out if this is a large or a small company. And based on that, you would be able to kind of get some more information about whether you should expect a full blown code test with, you know, data structures and algorithms, or if you're going to have something a little bit lighter, you know, like some basic hacker rank or leak code questions. Another thing you can do to prepare is to prepare for us is to actually do some pair coding with somebody on a call. Personally, what I've done, I mean, I've even had my friends or my family just sit on a Zoom chat while I go through and answer a couple leak code problems just to kind of get myself used to the feeling of being watched. Because believe it or not, it has a big impact on your performance. I don't know about you guys, but if I'm being stared at while I'm coding or if I have the feeling I'm being stared at in a Zoom call, it makes me a little nervous and can often shake my ability to think clearly. So kind of desensitizing yourself to that process will help out a lot. I, I can promise you that. It may not be perfect, but it'll at least take a little bit of the edge off when it comes to actually interviewing in person and doing in-person coding assessments or whiteboarding. Now, for those of you who don't know, whiteboarding is the process of solving a coding problem without the use of a physical, not physical, about the use of a full-fledged IDE like VS Code or Visual Studio. So sometimes, you know, I think virtually now since, ever, since the pandemic, if you are encountering any form of whiteboarding, they might ask you to write code in like a notepad or some scratch board or something like that. You're not really going to do it in person anymore where you actually go on a physical whiteboard. But either way, the best way to prepare for this is to kind of follow the same process that I mentioned before. Set yourself up with a family member or with somebody who can just sit in a Zoom call and answer some leak code questions or hacker rank questions or any basic questions related to the language or technology that you're using. If you want to specifically prepare for a whiteboarding exam, you can do so by essentially answering these questions without an editor, whether that's writing them down or using notepad or something without any type of IntelliSense or color highlighting. I think the, the biggest thing I want to emphasize, though, is that 
these code tests aren't exactly meant to show how well you're able to answer these one-off questions or questions unrelated to the technology or the work that you'll actually be doing, but more so to be able to visualize and communicate your thought process when it comes to critically thinking and solving problems. So what I say to what I mean to say is you don't need to focus so much on getting the answer 100% right or even in a time strain allotted because sometimes these in-person tests can be like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. It's a lot less important to get it 100% right or get it done in time as it is when compared to being able to articulate your process and how you think about solving a problem and being able to communicate that process, even if you don't know how to necessarily code it. Because in the end of the day, everybody, especially people who actually are in the position already, understands you're going to learn most of the syntax and most of the, the code you're going to write on the job. And you're going to be able to have the ability to research things you don't know while you're working. So nobody expects everyone that they interview to be able to perfectly answer or come up with the perfect solution for a code test. It's sometimes hard to remember that when you're in the process of taking this test, but I try to keep it in the back of your mind that it's not so much about accuracy or performance as it is your ability to communicate and critically think effectively. So after your interview, there's a couple of post-interview behaviors that I think would really take your process to the next level. Um, the first thing is I would highly recommend emailing every company or every person that you interview, um, just showing some grat gratitude and you know letting them know that you appreciate them taking the time out of their day to interview you and to consider you for the position. Believe it or not, this goes a long way. I've gotten a lot. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback, um, even in positions that I weren't accepted by, just for you know showing that extra effort. And you never know what kind of bridges you can build or networks you can connect that will you know provide you with an opportunity later. I've actually had people hit me back um, on LinkedIn saying, hey, I really appreciated working with you, even though we didn't select you for this position. We'll keep you in mind for another specific position that may open up, or they may refer you to somebody else they know who is looking for something similar. One of the most common things you'll probably run into as somebody who's applying for their first dev job, I think it's inevitable that some jobs you apply to, they may respond saying you don't have enough specific experience. When I applied to Red Ventures, which was a local marketing company here in North Carolina, one of the things, the feedback that I got was I didn't have enough corporate experience to be able to justify my lack, you know, lack of tenure or, you know, lack of uh, overall experience when applying for that particular company. I think that particular position I applied to was a mid-level instead of an entry level. Yeah, I was kind of jumping the gun a little bit, but I was excited because I had previous design experience, et cetera. But that is still something you can consider when it comes to like applying to a lot of jobs. You're going to be sending out a lot of applications and not all of them you're going to be qualified for. So it's okay if you, you know, don't get the job or you get rejected, as I talked about in my previous video. But some of these post-interview behaviors you can implement it will just make you like leave a lasting impression on either the recruiter or the hiring manager or the company itself that you may be applying to. And who knows what opportunities that can present you later. I definitely recommend emailing the company with gratitude. If you do not get the job, always, always, always ask for feedback. I kind of mentioned this in one of my other videos, but I found that whenever I interview with a company, if I have the direct line or the direct email to the person I actually interviewed with, I'll shoot them an email or I'll shoot them a LinkedIn message and say, hey, I understand you didn't pick me for the position. Is there any reasons that you can give me that would help me going forward as to like what I can improve on or what I didn't talk about or what I didn't speak well enough about to kind of help me in my journey? And almost I would say roughly seven out of 10 times I've gotten feedback and they're like, oh yeah, you know, sometimes uh, we felt like you didn't have enough corporate experience or you didn't talk too much about or well enough about this specific topic and we're really looking for somebody who has a solid foundation in that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This information will help you going forward when it comes to like studying a specific topic or studying something specific to a particular position that you may really want. Um, so that way in your next interview, you're just that much more prepared and you feel more confident because you don't feel like you're just interviewing and not getting anything out of it. You feel like you gained a little bit of something after each experience. And that's really what it's about because eventually you'll get so confident and so knowledgeable that you'll just land your first job and it's just going to happen just like it did for me. So I highly recommend you take some of that advice. I really hope this information helped. If you guys have any other specific questions or things I didn't talk about or go into detail enough in this particular video, drop a comment below, message me, email me, hit me up on Instagram. Either way, um, I have a long list of videos I want to make, but I really want to prioritize some of the things that will help you guys who are just graduating or just finishing up your self-learning process to really be able to get out there and get in the industry as fast as possible. 
So thank you guys for watching. I hope this video really helped. Um, I actually have the next video already ready uh, where I talk about dealing with failure and rejection. But anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next one. If you're ready to move on to the next video, there'll probably be a little I up in the video somewhere um, linking to the next video. So feel free to check that out. Um, drop a comment, like, subscribe. I really appreciate it.